Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Bakersfield West Rotary Stroop Family Foundation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, Kern High School District, and AC Electric Company. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. I'm Devin. And in studio with us we have Colton. And Colton, if somebody needed to get a hold of us today, what would they need to do? For math homework help, call in Bakersfield 636-4357. Everywhere else, 1-866-636-6284. Email do the math at kern.org or online at do the math online.net and on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, thank you for that. Colton, where do you go to school and what grade are you in? Panama in fourth. So you're in fourth grade at Panama. And how's that going so far? Good. What is, now obviously this year has been a little different than other years in school, all right? Is there anything that you find easier or more difficult this year about the way we're doing it? Um, it's difficult because it's hard to do um, the, like, hard to listen to the teacher because it might kick you out or glitch out. Right. So sometimes the, the, the audio gets a little glitchy sometimes. You can't hear everything. I understand the way that goes because it seems like every day there are kids that they get dropped from the Zoom class and then they have to get back in and things like that. So what is one thing you look forward to? So... Let's say next year you can go back to school like normal. What's one thing you're looking forward to when you go back to school? To actually play with my friends. There you go, actually be able to play with your friends and stuff. I think that's the uh, dominant answer that all kids have. They just want to be with their friends, see their friends, and just hang out and stuff with them, all right? You ready to do a little math today? All right, yeah. well, get ready, because before we do any math with you, we're first going to take a look at today's Math in the News. <laughs> All right, so today's math in the news has to do with something that everybody has seen. At one point in their life, if you have been outside on a roadway near a gas station, you have seen this at some point in your life. So let's take a look at the uh, photo that I brought in. Unleaded plus, 309 and 9 tenths. Now, do you notice anything about that, Colton, that seems off or might be missing? Um... The nine tenths are um, ten tenths? Yeah, the nine tenths, mm -hmm. right? It's like, all right, how, how do I pay nine tenths of something, right? Now, another thing I just noticed is you'd like to have a decimal point in there also. Uh, otherwise, the it could be a yeah. couple of different things. But anyway, this has been in the news before, and it recently came up again. So I figured let's go ahead and visit this little nine tenths issue again. So, what's with the fraction of a penny? I'll give you one guess who to blame it on. I'll give you a couple of seconds. Who can you blame it on for the fraction of a cent? That's right, you're correct. The government, all right? And the Great Depression. The Revenue Tax Act of 1932 allowed for a federal tax of one cent to be placed on gas prices to help offset the national debt. Because gas was priced in pennies those days, a fraction of a cent was considered reasonable. So if you wanted a gallon of gas and it cost you 10 cents, and then somebody else said, well, you know, there's this fraction of a cent, it's 10 and 9 tenths cent, so we're just going to make it 11 cents. 
Well, if you drive up someplace and you go, why is it now 11 cents? Yesterday it was 10 cents. I'm not buying gas here anymore for that extra penny. I'm going to the other place where it's 10 cents. And that was the attitude that they had back then. All right. Well, <laughs> by the 1970s, nine tenths became the standard. And that's why you see it on gas prices all of the time. Federal and state tax for gas is still a fraction of a penny. It's not rounded in any way. It is still fractional parts of a penny. Gas stations don't make that much profit actually off of gas. It's a lot of taxes. And if they were to lop off, so let's say they go, you know what, we're just going to make it 309 and we're going to take off the nine tenths of a cent. They would be losing 20% of sales. Ooh. All right. So they're going to leave it on there because of their profit margin. Okay. So gas costing 309 and 9 tenths is going to look more appealing to somebody than if it was $3.10. All right. So they're going to leave it like that. Now, there were people that experimented with this. All right. Uh, there was a Texaco station. A lot of Texacos, as a matter of fact, tried this. What they did is they took the 9 tenths off and just left it at, say, 309 right here. Mm -hmm. Well, people thought it was 308 and 9 tenths, actually, right? And they're like, why are they putting 309? We know what it is, actually, so they must be doing something. It didn't work. He didn't get sales, so he lost revenue simply by not putting the 9 tenths on the sign. He thought he was doing everybody a favor by, look, I'm going to save you 9 tenths of a cent every gallon. And people are like, I don't know what you're doing, but we don't like that. You're actually probably doing 308 and 9 tenths and just rounding it up to 309. And people were so accustomed to it that he lost money and he eventually just went back to the 9 tenths and everything kind of went back to normal again. That is today's Math in the News. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30, most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the entire school year, except for the very end of school. And that brings us to a programming note. Next week is the last week for live broadcasting of Do the Math. So today's St. Paddy's Day 2021. Next week, the 24th, the final live broadcast for this year. And then we'll come back in September for season 2021. And a, uh, a lot of fun that will be. In studio, we have Colton. How are you? Good. You ready to do a little bit of math? Yeah. All right, well, hang tight there, young man, because right now we have an opportunity to continue our series and see the making of milk. After the milk comes out of the cow, it has to be dropped down to 40 degrees, and that's part of the equipment that helps get it done. This uh, green transformer here, that is uh, PG&E coming in and delivering the power to us. Inside the room, we have the electrical panel that the transformer is feeding. The dairy runs seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So if there's a, a hiccup in power, if the power goes down for any reason, it happens, somebody hits a pole, power goes out, we have a backup generator that we turn on, and that provides the power, the power we need to, to get the job done. Wow. Are you, is there any solar at all on the dairy? We do have solar. It's brand new. It's, it's not uh, functioning yet, but it is uh, in the, pro we are in the process of putting in solar. I can imagine that technology is constantly changing for you. Uh, technology helps with the process of getting the job done here. That's why we're imp implementing the solar. Uh, we also have a methane digester that uh, covers the lagoon. 
and captures, and it captures the gas, and that gas is captured, and it's run through an engine, which runs a generator, and it produces electricity, but that electricity is not for dairy use. That is being, that is another company that is doing that for, uh, they're basically capturing the gas and turning it into electricity. Wow, that is amazing. You've talked about so much about, you know, like I said, you know, growing the feed and just so self-sufficient out here. It's almost like you're using every single part that you possibly can. Well, here on the dairy, we, we really don't waste anything. Everything is being used, reused, reused again, over and over again. So when it comes to the farming, when it comes to the water use, there's no waste of water. Water gets used multiple times. Cows drinking water, cows drinking 40 to 50 gallons a day of water, Water is being used for cooling of the milk. Water is used for washing the equipment. And then once that goes down the drain, it goes to the waste area. Then from the waste area, it's pumped back again and is used to clean all the lanes that the cows are living in, the cement, the concrete lanes. That is so interesting. So is this the only area that you have all of this power source, or do you have another area on the dairy where you have some more? This is where all the power is coming in. So this is the, the main center for the power. Great. Well, there's so much more to see today. I cannot wait. But for now, Mike, we're going to send it back to you at the studio. All right. Thank you, Mary Lou. Also, thank you to Felix, and thank you to uh, inviting us out there once again. This is our second visit out to uh, Felix's Dairy, and there certainly is a lot to learn and still more to come. We do have phone tutors available until 530. Even more importantly, we have Colton a student at Panama Elementary in studio with us. And right now, where you're at in your math book is you're working with some mixed numbers right now. So let's take a look at your math book. And we've got 5 and 3 6 plus, and then it's got in parentheses, 5 and 5 6 plus 4 and 3 6. So I'm going to have you and Devin work on this and talk first about why those numbers are in parentheses and what that may do to help you with this problem, if it does anything at all, and what you're supposed to do with this. All right, so why don't you head to the board and you and Devin can go ahead and tackle this problem. All right, Colton, go ahead and pick up one of those pens and let's talk a little bit about those parentheses. So when you see, let's even take fractions out of the, out of, out of the, uh, the conversation. When you see parentheses in an addition expression, what does that make you think about or what are you thinking as you see them? Um, that they're um, trying to keep them into them that usually there's a reason keep numbers apart so what you're saying is the parentheses are there for a reason and that's to keep values together right now what's interesting with parentheses is sometimes they have that purpose other times we look and we realize it may be easier if we don't need them there so let me ask you this let's just let's look back at some other values here all right let's take a look at something like um, well, let me go ahead and come up here Let's say if we had something like this, 3 plus, and I'll put in parentheses, 5 plus 5. OK? Real quickly, what is this going to equal? Uh, 13. 13, because you have 5 and 5, right? That's 10. And so this is 3 plus 10. Now let me ask you this. If we grouped two different numbers together, let's say we did 3 plus 5 plus 5. What does that do for us? Uh, this makes it uh, where you can add it in a different form. So we can add it in a different form. So you would add 3 plus 5 first. So we would have 8 plus 5, which equals what? 13. 13. So it really doesn't do anything. In addition, we have this a set of properties. We have the commutative property, which means we can move numbers around and still have the same sum. We have the associative properties, which means in a set of values, we can group values differently and still end up in the same place. Now, that's a really important idea as we look at this problem right here. So let's revisit these fractions. And let's think about the parentheses. Are these parentheses absolutely necessary? No. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Could you erase those parentheses? 
now that we have some freedom from our parentheses, and this you know, is generally going to work with addition as well as multiplication. If we have expressions that have just addition or just multiplication, parentheses aren't always necessary. So now we know that we can move these values around and we can add them in different orders to get to where we want to go. Now let's take a look at the fractions here. What do we notice about these fractions? Um, they all have the same denominator of 6. That's a great observation there. They all have the same denominator of 6. And what that means is, is that we can break these and, and add them together without having to convert them into anything else. Right? We can keep these as sixths. Wonderful. So how would you approach this situation now? By adding all these together. OK, so you want to add the whole values together, right? And I think what you're doing is you're recognizing that mixed numbers are essentially addition of a whole number and a fraction. So what you're really doing is, in your head, you are putting an addition symbol between each of these mixed numbers. And you're going to kind of rearrange this here. You're going to add the whole numbers first. So you're going to kind of reframe this. You're reframing this as 5 plus 5 plus 4, so all the whole numbers, and then all the fractions together. 3 sixths plus 5 sixths plus 3 sixths. Now let's get to these fractions a little bit later on, because essentially what you're doing is this. You're adding the whole numbers first, and then you're going to add the fractions. So go ahead and add the whole numbers first. Let's get that out of the way, because that seems to be the most straightforward. OK, 5 plus 5 equals 10. OK. And then you add, and then you do 10 plus 4 equals 14. So we know that the, whole, the value of the whole numbers combined together has a sum of 14. So let's talk about these fractions now. How are we going to combine these fractions? Or is there a quicker way that you think we might be able to do that? Um, take 3, 6, and 3, 6. That's wonderful. You're using the commutative property, and you're adding the 3, 6 together, because together they make what? One, a whole number. One whole. So we're going to go ahead and bring these two together. That's one whole. And we're going to add that to the 14 eventually, right? So what are we going to do with this 5 sixths? We're going to add it to all of these together. Yeah. So can we combine any two of these? We, we, we think we have our fraction here, 5 sixths. What are we going to do about the 14 and the 1? Add them together. Let's add them together. 14 plus 1 equals 15. So we have 15. We have 5 sixths. Let's go ahead and bring that 5 sixths down here. And what is that going to equal for us? 15, 5, 6. 15. And we can probably just get rid of that mixed number now, right? 15 and 5, 6. So when we add 5 and 3, 6, 5 and 5, 6, and 4 and 3, 6, we end up with a mixed number value of 15 and 5, 6. Wonderful job. Yeah, that is a great problem right there. And I am especially thankful that you approached that fractional part where you went 3 6 plus 3 6 to make one whole. 99% of the other kids, I think, would have gone 3 6 plus 5 6 plus 3 6 and gotten 11 6. Right. And then sometimes that makes another step where you could possibly mess that up and come up with the wrong answer, even though you are going about it the right way. So nicely done on that, Colton. I, uh, I was very impressed with that, putting the 3 6s together. So do me a favor, erase the board, because I've got another great problem right out of your math book here for you. Here right? we go. So this is on the next page. So let's take a look at it together. This one's going to be a little different. A gift shop sells walnuts in three-fourths pounds bags and will buy some bags of walnuts and repackage them into one-pound bags. What is the least number of three-fourths pound bags Anne could buy if she wants to fill one-pound bags without leftovers? So now you're going to have to think a little bit. It's not a straightforward problem here. All right? So you and Devin, head to the board. And this one's all yours, boys. There's a lot to work with here. 
especially with different sized portions, to get to something where there's nothing left over. So let's talk a little bit about what we know, right? Before we dive into any problem, we have what we know and what we need to find, OK? So let's start off with what we know. What do we know based off of what you see in the problem here? She has three-fourths pounds of bags, and she wants to make one pound. OK, so we, the, 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 the shop sells three-fourths bags. And we can illustrate that. I'm just going to make this a little bag up here. OK, that's three-fourths of a pound. What else do we know? We know that Anne will buy some bags and use them to make one pound bags, right? So Anne wants um, she, it says she wants to buy some bags to make one, a whole one pound, right? Right. She wants to make one pound using other bags she buys, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. So, what is the least number of three-fourths pound bags Anne could buy if she wants to fill each one pound bag without leftovers? So let's talk about how she's going to use a three-fourths bag to make another three-fourths bag into a one pound bag. She's done going to use another bag to make one pound. So how much of the three-fourths of a pound bag is she going to use to make another bag one pound? What does she have to add to three-fourths? One-fourth. One-fourth. So we have to take a fourth away from this, right? So we have three-fourths here. We're taking from one three-fourths bag, and we're bringing over one-fourth. Right? So now what's left in this bag? Two-fourths. Two-fourths. OK. And so far, so just to keep you guys on track, you've now used two three-fourth pound bags. Right. And you have one one-pound bag. And we don't even care how many one-pound bags we have. We just want to make sure we don't have any leftovers. But now you've used two three-fourth pound bags. But Does that make sense? But we haven't entirely yeah. used two bags. We still have one bag that only has two-fourths of a bag left. So we can use Right, part so of you're that. going to be using more. Exactly. So let's bring in another three-fourths bag. So we have one bag here. We have two bags here. We're using our second bag still. Now let's look at our third bag here. We're going to make that a one-pound bag by bringing some of this bag over. How much are we bringing over? One. OK, and this is still the second bag, so one fourth. So now we have one pound. Since we've taken a fourth away from this, what so do we have left? One fourth. One fourth. So let's make another one pound bag. This is going to be how many bags now that we've used? Three. We've used three, so we're going to have to bring another in. So how many will this be? Four. Four. Here's our fourth bag. All right. How much do we need to bring over to make a one pound bag? One fourth. One fourth. So what's left over now? Zero. So we have no leftovers. So how many bags did we need to use to make one pound bags with nothing left over? Four. Four. There you go. It's all Nicely took. done. Since that problem is dealing with food right there, got me a little hungry. And you, young man, have got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Grillin' Burger. So congratulations on that. Really? Make sure when you go down, you say hi to Lydia. Let her know you're on Do The Math, and uh, she'll take care of you. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30, but right now we have another opportunity to go visit Mary Lou and continue the making of milk. Mary Lou? And I am back with Felix. Felix, before we've talked about the diet of calves, well, we're obviously not here for diet of the calves. <laughs> Can you kind of explain where we're at? Well, this is basically the kitchen of the dairy. This is where all the recipes are made for the cows and for the calves and for all the animals that are here. So here we have all the feeds separated. Uh, to our right here, we have rolled corn. This is basically comes, comes here by rail from the Midwest. And we feed a lot of corn. You know, we feed probably, oh, 
well, close to 2,000 ton of corn in a month. Wow, and, and looking down at it, you can see, is it kind of grounded down, is that? Well, what we're seeing here, the, the corn is actually steam rolled and flaked, but as it gets run over and stuff, it, yeah. it gets pounded a little bit. But as if we were going go in the pile there, you can see it's, it's more of a flake. And when you, when you break open the, the, the kernel of the corn, that's when it becomes access, uh, accessible to the cow. The cow's uh, rumen can uh, digest it, and when if it's just whole like that, it passes right through the cow, you don't get any of the nutritional advantage of feeding it to the cow. So it's important that it either be ground or rolled. And with the other feeds that we have here, that is part of the grain. Uh, we also have roughages here. Uh, we have uh, uh, corn that we grow in our fields. And that corn, when we, when we harvest the corn from the field, it, we harvest the whole plant. And that whole plant is chopped up along with the kernel. And that is placed into these large piles here that you see that are covered with plastic. Now that, that feed is great feed, but you can't feed it all right away. So by putting it in these large piles like this, we get to save it and feed it later at a later date. And we have a lot of feed that is set up in this area that is just set up like this. Our wheat in the, in the, uh, the winter wheat is grown and that gets uh, harvested in around uh, late May, early June. And then, and then we plant the corn after that, and then that gets harvested around October. And that is all brought into this area and stored for later use. Along with, uh, we also have alfalfa hay and uh, other uh, grasses that we feed the animals. But all this feed is stored here. Uh, a lot of these grains, as you can see, the, the tractor, he's he started uh, picking each feed up. He's gonna take it into the uh, the, the green box over there and that is like a that's a, a giant mixer it mixes the feed and when we go to feed the cows we like to have all the feeds mixed together in a it's called a totally mixed ration and having it all be mixed together like that helps the cow eat it all at the same time this way it keeps the uh, the cow's stomach in better condition she doesn't get acidic if she eats just too much of one thing. Cows have a way, cows are just like people. If there's something sweet in the ration, they might sort through it and eat that first. But by mixing it all together, we, we help, help to prevent that from happening. And uh, they also get their vitamins and minerals in, uh, put all together. So it's almost like a recipe. It is a, little a recipe. A little bit, little bit, mixing it all together. Now, I noticed each one you said that everything is separated, so there's obviously different types of feed in each um, area here, correct? For the most part, some of some of the that we feed a lot of may take two two actual two bays, like the corn. We feed a lot of the corn, but a lot of the other uh, byproducts uh, we feed less of, and it all depends on what we have a uh, nutritionist who formulates the rations for us. And those, those rations are formulated for just the amount, right amount of protein, just the right amount of carbohydrates, right, just the right amount of fat to, to, for, to promote milk production and cow health. Wow. It's so interesting because you think that, oh, they're just going to eat one particular type of feed and then take it out to them. But no, there's a lot of math actually required in that. Yes, the, the, the rations definitely are calculated and uh, they, the, the, the they come up with the rations using math, and uh, um, as you as you can see, he's he's uh, that is uh, almond hulls, a byproduct from uh, the, the almond industry in 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 the, in the area. That's that's being fed to the cows also. Well, there's so much more here to see, but for right now, Mike, we're going to send it back to you in the studio. All right, thanks for that, Mary Lou, and uh, make sure to keep all those rations exactly the way you need them. We need healthy cows out there. In studio, we have Colton, a student at Panama Elementary, who's been doing some wonderful work with fractions and mixed numbers. So I'm quite confident of your ability to add those fractions and mixed numbers because you did a wonderful job with those first couple of problems. So we're going to move on to multiplying some now. All right. So have you done any of this yet? Yeah. A little bit? Good. All right. Well, let's go to it. I'll give you two problems. The first one we're going to do is six times three eighths. 
All right, so head on over to the board, and you and Devin can work on that. Six times three-eighths. So you've said that you've done a little bit of this work before. Let's go ahead and take a look at how you would approach this. So what would you do to start off with six, and three, six times three-eighths? Um, I would do six times eighths. Okay, so tell me why you would do six times eight first. Because you multiply the denominator and then you add it to the three. Now, that would be if we were converting six and three-eighths into a mixed number. But what we're really doing here, let's look back at the original problem here. I'm going to move this to the side. I'm not going to erase it because that is a thought process that I want to make sure that we revisit. All right. What we're looking at is six times three-eighths. So I want to reflect back to the last problem we did and, and the way that we added some of the fractions with common denominators. Because you were really solid with that thinking. And I want to use that. If we think about, let's say, 3 times 4. All right? If I write 3 times 4, how could I rewrite that as an addition problem? You Because when we think of multiplication, we're essentially skip counting or repeat adding, right? So how could we rewrite this using addition? Four, four, plus four, four plus four. Yeah, we're going to add four three times, OK? So let's think about this, right? And I like the way that you phrase it. We're going to add four three times. We're going to add the second num value this many times, the first many times. So let's look at six times three eighths. How could we rewrite that as an addition problem? Do 8 plus hmm. 8 plus 8 well that's, well, that's if you're going to be adding 8 a certain number of times. Remember, this second value is 3 eighths, right? So how many times would we add 3 eighths to itself if we're treating this like a repeated addition problem? Um, right? If, if 3 eight. times 4 is 4 added to itself 3 times, then 6 times 3 eighths is 3 eighths added to itself oh, six, times. 6 times. So let's do that. Let's add 3 eighths 6 times. Now, this is actually starting to look pretty similar to that first problem we had, where we had all sixths as our denominator, right? In this case, we have all eighths as our denominator. So what could we do with all these numerators? Add them together? Yeah, let's add all the numerators together, so all those threes. We're going to add 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3. And if you think about that, when we add 3 to itself 6 times, what's the multiplication version of that? 3 times 6. 3 times 6. So what's 3 times 6 here? 18. 3 times 6 is 18. So we're going to have 18. And what's the situation with our denominator? They're all 8s. So 18 8s. 18 8s. 18 8s. Now that's really interesting. Let's go back up here. I want to show you something really quickly, OK? Because in the beginning, you started multiplying the whole number by the denominator. But what two parts of this, when you multiply them, get you to 18? 6 times 3. 6 times 3. So when you multiply a whole number by a fraction, you're going to multiply the whole number by the numerator and then carry over the denominator. So 18. Eighths. There's a lot of different ways to look at it, but very similar to how you know that you can add fractions by th that have a common denominator by just adding their numerators together, we can think the same way when it comes to multiplying a fraction by a whole number. Well done. All right. Very good. Let's take a look at the next problem that you've got. This one is going to maybe end up a little differently than what you just did. 2 times 5 tenths. 2 times 5 tenths. So I'm going to go ahead, after our conversation on that last problem, I'm going to have you approach this on your side. So 
How would you tackle two times five tenths? Multiply two times five. Okay, so we're going to multiply the whole number by the numerator. Okay, go ahead. Two times five. What does two times five give us? Ten. Ten. So that we have ten, we know that's our numerator, right? What is our denominator going to be? Ten. Ten. So ten tenths. Now, we, we could leave it like that, but this is actually a very friendly fraction to work with because we can do something with it. What can we do with 10 tenths? Make it one whole. One whole. So, 2 times 5 tenths equals 10 tenths, which is one whole. And that makes sense because if you think about 2 times 5 tenths, just like we did before, this is the same thing as 5 tenths plus 5 tenths. Right? We're adding 5 tenths to itself two times. And if you add those two fractions together, 5 plus 5 is 10. Same place, same spot, same solution, same result. 2 times 5 tenths is 1 whole, Colton. Nicely done. There you go. All right. You know what? You guys went through those pretty quickly. I've got a bonus problem for you now. Bonus! So erase the board and let's put this right, one up there. Here we go. It's always good to have another bonus problem on there. All right. So let's go ahead and write this down and then we'll leave the blank space for yeah. what you guys need to work on. So we have five times something over four is equal to ten fourths. So Colton, how are you going to figure out what goes in that space? By um. Right, you can head right over to the board, start writing whatever you need to, and if you need help, Devin's right there. Doing five times something that equals ten. So you know that 5 times something is going to have to equal 10 because of the way that we just worked out how to multiply a whole number by a fraction. So if this is going to be true, what does that numerator need to be? 2. Okay. So go ahead and throw that in there. Now how can we be certain that this is correct? Because 2 times 5 equals 10. Okay. So you're going to actually work this out. You're going to do 5 times 2, and that equals 10. And you're going to multiply that, and you're going to bring that over 4. So we can do that. You know what's interesting, too, about this um, is that you can also treat this like an addition problem. You can have 2 fourths added 5 times. And you're going to add, under that same thinking, 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, right? And we know that 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals what? 10. 10. And because these are all the same common denominator, we can Four. keep the denominator there. 10 fourths, 10 fourths. It looks like 2 is our solution. There you go. Nicely done. All right. Clear the board. Colton, I'm going to give you a break right now. And Devin, if you could draw a line down the middle of the board, because you're going to need two halves here. All right. So, you, yeah, you right don't need to pad there. anymore. You can just. All right. I'm moving On up. The top of the left side, here's what we're going to write. Mean is less than mode, and that is less than median. Okay, mean is less than mode is less than median. Right, now on the other side, median is less than mode, which is less than mean. Now, here's, because the reason we're going to do this problem, and I gave you both of them, because yesterday we started working on one with Mary, a sixth grade student, uh, and today I'm going to have you continue working on these, because there are some students that have phoned in about this problem, and there are students that have even emailed about this problem. So here are the parameters. Here's what you need to do. You have to have a set of five numbers for each of those. They're obviously not going to be the same five numbers for both, because it wouldn't satisfy both of those. It doesn't matter what the five numbers are. They can be positive numbers, negative numbers, uh, decimals, whatever you want. They can be any numbers at all, but you have to use five numbers and then satisfy one side and then try and satisfy the other side. All right? So it's up to you. Go so to it. That's really interesting. And, and, you know, in any case like this, what I would generally do is just kind of guess and check. I feel like a lot of times in math, we overlook guess and check as a meaningful strategy. How great would it be if you could guess and check and get your answers right away? So let's try that. 
especially when it comes to mean, median, and mode, let's work with some easy numbers. There's no reason to make this any harder than it has to be for ourselves. So I know that I have five numbers I'm going to have to work with. So when I think about numbers I'm going to have to work with for a mean or an average, right? Maybe I'll work with multiples of 10. And I say that because that's going to be pretty easy to divide by 5. So let's try that. Let's start off with 0, 10, 20, 30, and 40. Now for this set of numbers, I want to find out our three measures of center variation. I want to find our mean, our median, and our mode. Now it's actually pretty straightforward here. Because I've already put these in order, I know what my median is. I know that my median is going to be 20. That's great. Now if I start to average these out, if I add them all together and divide by 5, and the reason I went with these is because I can quickly add them together and get 100. Here's 50, and here's 50. I don't worry about that, 0. So I know that if I divide 100 by 5, oh, that's interesting. My mean is also 20. Where I run into a challenge is my mode. The mode is identified as the number that occurs the most. Here, they all occur one time each. No value appears more than any other. So in this case, I don't have a mode. And if I don't have a mode, I don't have anything I can put into these three inequalities. And so, I'm glad you brought that up because there are students that have tried this problem and they try saying if there is no mode, they put zero, but zero is an actual number and that doesn't right. account for the same as none. Now, if I wanted to have zero as my mode, I would need to get rid of one of these numbers. So let's do that. I'm going to get rid of 40. I'm going to get rid of 40. I'm going to pick up that pen after I dropped it. And I'm going to give myself another 0 here. I'm going to give myself a 0 for dropping that pen is what I'm going to do. But now I do have a mode. It's 0. But because I took the 40 out, my mean and my median have changed. So for the sake of getting a number I can identify as a mode, I've got to revisit my mean and my median. Let's take a look at mean. Add these together. 0, 0. Blah. 10 plus 20 plus 30, there's 60. 60 divided by 5, oh, that's 12. OK, that's 12. Now let's look at the median here. The median, because I have these in order again, I'm looking right at the center here, and I have 10. And if this is my case, if this is what I have as my three values, then as it is right now, my mode would be the lowest. My median would be my center. And then my mean would be my greatest. That is not going to help me with any of these right now. But let's see if these put me in a situation where I might be able to work a little closer. In this case, the median is less than the mean, such as the case up here. So that means I feel like I'm closer to this than I am to that. So I'm going to play around with this a little more. I'm going to see if there's a way for me to sneak a mode in so that I still have a median less than a mean. That's going to take some playing around with. But it also informs me that maybe I want to sneak something a little on the lesser side here so I can keep the mean low. And you've got one minute to keep working on this, and then we'll keep moving. <laughs> so let's try that. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these zeros, knowing that it's going to change all of these other values. I want to stick with multiples of 5 because I want to keep dividing by 5. So I'm going to move this 10 out here. And I'm going to now bring my median into a 15. I'm going to try 15. So let's. Add these together, figure it out. I know my mode is 15. If my median is less than my mode, that's great. However, looking at the middle here, median is 15. So it's not going to hold true because the median and the mode are the same. The, mo the uh, median is not less than the mode. That's good information, though, because now I can work a little bit lower 
Maybe let's go 14. And what you'll do is keep working on that because right now we do have a moment to uh, check out. A lot of people go, well, that's just dirt. Well, that's soil. What's the difference between them? We'll find out now. played in the dirt as a kid. Maybe you made mud pies or dug holes with a special truck. And you probably came home with dirt on your pants and were sent inside to wash the dirt off your hands. But do you know how important that dirt really is? Dirt, or soil, is actually one of our world's most useful natural resources. Without soil, most plants could not grow. People and animals would not have food to eat. There would be no wood to build houses or cotton to make clothes. Just think about all the things you use every day that started in the soil. Soil basically takes like, uh, you know, like thousands or millions of years to form. Soil is actually a mixture of uh, minerals, uh, air, water, organic matter, which may be plant residue or the animal remains. The decayed animal matter and plants, that's called humus. And the humus is actually a really, really dark, organically rich soil. And therefore, the plants that are in that humus feed off of those nutrients in order to, you know, sustain themselves. But the humus has another important job. It acts like a sponge, soaking up the rainwater to keep the soil moist. Every time it rains or snows, the water seeps into the ground. The soil is where all the extra water is stored, so plants can use it at a later time. Scientists can actually measure how much water is in the soil. They call this measurement soil moisture. You can even measure soil moisture in your own backyard. All you need is a soil moisture probe. You probably don't have one at home, but your school might. You just stick the probe into the ground and read what the meter says. The higher the number, the more moisture there is in the soil. NASA understands how important the soil is to life here on Earth, and why it is important to understand how much moisture soil holds. But how do scientists measure soil moisture for the entire Earth? SMAP is the Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission, and it is a mission that will be measuring soil moisture from space. Most of the time, people underestimate the importance of soil moisture. You can think of how important it is to um, grow crops for food. Growing crops, growing any vegetation, trees, uh, grasses, depends on how much water there is in the soil. Soil moisture is a, a kind of a nice indicator of drought because drought is basically a lack of water. And where do you see that lack of water? You can see that lack of water in the, in the soil. By studying this one variable in the soil, soil moisture, there are so many applications that benefit mankind. SMAP will measure the entire planet's soil moisture every three days. That's definitely faster than using this. I know there are many different kinds of soil. Does all soil hold the same amount of moisture? Different uh, soil textures, different soil uh, sizes have different abilities to hold the water. You can think of a texture of a soil as being uh, how, much, how much sand you have versus how much clay you have versus how much silt you have. Um, those relative amounts, those relative percentages, determine the texture of a soil. Um, they affect how the water drains through the soil and how much water the soil can hold. So different types of soil hold different amounts of water. I wonder, what other things can affect soil moisture? Soil moisture can also be affected by things like uh, frozen soil, you know, when the ground is frozen. Why is that important? Because when the, uh, the ground is frozen, then a lot of what we call the hydrological cycle involving the land, the movement of water between the land and the atmosphere, for example, um, stops. What we're going to be able to um, determine is the, the freeze-thaw cycle. It's a seasonal cycle of freeze-thaw. Even though it is frozen, it is still part of the soil. You can see that studying soil moisture is very important. It can help predict when a drought may occur or if a flood is likely to happen. It can even help farmers improve their crops or help us understand more about water in the frozen ground. So as SMAP collects measurements about soil moisture, NASA will be helping make our world a better place to live. Man, you can always find out more about soil, more than you even thought you knew. All right. We had Devin working on mean, median, and mode for a couple of students that were working on that as well. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but first, we do have Colton in studio, a student from Panama Elementary and working with fractions. 
So this one's going to be a little different. You're not actually going, well, we'll see how you attack it. But we're going to look at the problem and see what went wrong with it the first time. All right, so let's take a look at it right now. Molly is baking for the Moms and Muffins event at her school. She's going to bake four batches of banana muffins. She needs one and three-fourths cup of banana for each batch of muffins. Molly completed the multiplication below and said she needed eight cups of bananas for four batches of muffins. What is Molly's error? So, it might be advantageous if you guys maybe write her problem up there and see if you can figure out what went wrong. So we have four times one and three-fourths equals four times eight-fourths equals 32 fourths equals eight. All right, Colton, head on over to the board with Devin and see if you can figure out what went wrong. Because if you just look at the end of the problem, 32 over four is eight. So it's helpful to think about this as kind of steps along the path, right? So this is where we started. Now let's call this part A, right? The beginning. Then she took this and reconfigured it to this. Let's call this step B. Then she multiplied and got this. Let's call this step C. To get to the end, as she uh, simplified this into a whole number or D. So let's talk about each step of the way here. Is there anything that stands out to you in any of these steps as unusual or maybe a possible error? 32 less more than 4. So we know that that's an improper fraction, and generally people don't like improper fractions. It's the way people feel about them. I feel like all fractions are good in my eyes. So you think that this part may not equate to 8. How can we check to see if 32 fourths does in fact get us to 8? 32 divided by 4. Okay, so what does 32 divided by 4 get us? 8. So it looks like this part works out okay. So going from C to D, that works out. That makes sense. Okay, so where else might there be a flaw? If we know that going from C to D works out, then it looks like it's either going to be going from A to B or B to C. Which one do we want to re-examine? A. A to B. So Molly goes from 4 times 1 and 3 fourths to 4 times 8 fourths. How do you think she reasoned that? Or how did she get from 1 and 3 fourths to 8 fourths? She added these two to make 5 and then added it to 3. Now, is that how we convert mixed numbers to improper fractions? No. So let's do that. Let's see what happens here. Con let's convert 1 and 3 fourths to an improper fraction. How do we do that? 4 plus 1 equals 5. Well, are we adding here? Because it, it, let's think about 1 and 3 fourths as 1 plus 3 fourths, right? Those parentheses are going to come in handy here. If we're going to add these together, what do we need to do to 1 to be able to add it to 3 fourths? Could we turn it into a fraction with a common denominator with 3 fourths? Mm, yeah. OK, so instead of 1 whole, it's something over 4, right? So what over 4 is equal to 1 whole? How many fourths is equivalent to one whole? Um, four. Yeah, four. So we're going to add four fourths plus three fourths. And what does that equal? Um, seven fourths. Seven fourths. So this is four times seven fourths. But what happened here? She had eight fourths. So it sounds like this is where it all went wrong. But you saw exactly how you could figure that out. So this would actually need to be 4 times 7 fourths. So we could multiply 4 times 7. What is 4 times 7? 4 times 7 is 28. 28 fourths. And so instead of 8, 28 fourths, we can simplify that. And what does that get us to? 5, 8, 4, 7, 4, Yeah, you do 28 divided by 5. I could hear you doing it kind of in your head, but your head is so powerful it's coming out your mouth too. So 28 fourths, or 28 divided by 4. Yeah, 
Maybe you could skip count ahead, right? Especially with the number as finicky as 28. So let's skip count by fours until we get to 28. Five. Okay, so 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. That's 5. Let's keep adding. 24, 28. There you go. Seven. You guys got seven. 7. Nicely done. You hey, you know what? We do have one more opportunity to go visit with Mary Lou and continue with the making of milk. And we are back with Felix from Echeveria Farms. Now, Felix, we just left the feeding area, which is pretty amazing. The kitchen, as you called it. Can you give us a little bit experience of how you got so involved with dairy life? Well, I, I had the experience of being lucky enough to grow up on the dairy farm. My parents are the ones that started the dairy farm. And I grew up working on the dairy farm, helping my parents. So growing up, I really didn't think much of dairy other than I have to do the work. I had my chores to do. But as I got older, I got to really appreciate uh, the dairy farm and when I went to school I went to a junior college and I took agriculture classes which got me even more interested in the dairy farm so I was able to relate what was happening um, on the dairy farm every day with theory I was learning in school so it really it really got my interest up and really a big reason why I'm in, in the dairy business now. Now what advice would you give students who obviously don't have that of being growing up on a dairy, but they're interested in, in dairy. What advice would you give them? Well, I think if, if you're interested in, in uh, agriculture, in any form of agriculture, uh, schooling is, is the best thing. Um, you can uh, take classes in, in high school probably. There's 4-H, uh, there's FFA that gets people involved with uh, animal agriculture. And that's a great way. And I've, I've, uh, we've, over the years, we've supported kids through the high school system here and helping them you know get a cow purchased and get some experience on the the taking care of a cow feeding the cow what it takes to how much it costs to, to take care of a cow and uh, day to day with these cows they're able to and, and in the end they they learn how to uh, make some money off the cow by selling the cow there is so much walking having you walk us through this dairy there's just so much back to it that people don't see, you're pretty much self-sufficient here. With you, you're growing the feed and, and the milking and you're taking the milk and you're feeding the calves. It all just comes together. Everything you know, is just working together. It's pretty amazing all the work that you do here just to provide that milk for us and for our cheeses and everything else you know, that goes with our food. And we thank you for that. And a little token of our appreciation, a little tile from us that is for you. Thank and, you and thank you so much. We really appreciate your time with walking us through your normal daily life. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. And that's it from Echeveria Farms. Back to you, Mike, at the studio. All right. Thanks for that, Mary Lou. And also thank you big once again to Felix for inviting us out there. Devin, you've got a couple of seconds to kind of explain where you left off with this problem. Well, and that's all I need because the answer does not exist. And here's why. In order for the mode to be greater than the median, than the mean, I'm sorry, than the median, both values have to be greater than the median. So both have to come in the latter two. And if that's the case, when you average them together, they cannot possibly be the greatest of those two values. So this situation, median less than mode, less than mean, is not possible with simply five values. And we'll take a more look at that next week. Did you have fun today, Colton? Yeah. Excellent. Hey, until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Bakersfield West Rotary Stroop Family Foundation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, Kern High School District, and AC Electric Company, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.